på en lille smule længere op. Meget, meget lidt. Så hvis du ligesom lukker øjnene nu? Ja. Og prøver at trække vejret sådan dybt ind. Hvad betyder ordet hjem for dig? Hjem er noget, som er trygt. Kabul, les attaques des Mujahideen var repris. Har du nogensinde fortalt din livshistorie før? Nej. Vi skal ud. Det er nu. Hun er mit ondt i Indiaboshi. Jeg har vildt dårligt som medier, at min bror han bliver tilbage. Vi flygtede nogle gange mennesker smule ned. Hvad er det, Halle? Der er nogle ting, som jeg har svært ved at ligesom snakke om. Mother! Men det er nogle ting, jeg ved, jeg skal få ind med med. Hvornår blev du egentlig sådan selv bevidst om, at du var homoseksuel? Altså, jeg var ikke særlig gammel. Jeg var ret betaget af sådan en klod vandom. Jeg kunne også godt lide sådan en klod vandom, men det var af andre årsager. Det går lidt rundt. Og tænk tilbage. Altså, det er min fortid, og det jeg kan ikke flygte fra det. Jeg har heller ikke lyst. Jeg kan mærke, at der skal ske noget. Her starter jo min historie. Hello and welcome to everybody. Um, another year at Animation Dingo. Um, as Mara said, I'm your host, Ben Hennessy, and I am honored to introduce to you Jess Nichols and Kenneth Ladiger. Um, Jess is the art director on the film Flea, and Kenneth is the animation director and lead board artist. Um, so first off, to you both, congratulations. It is no small feat getting a film nominated in three categories in the Oscars. Um, Having seen Flea, I can completely understand why it's in these uh, categories and doing so well and, and picking up almost every award and, and, and accolade as, as it goes into the the uh, the film uh, circuit. Um, it's it's a beautiful film and I can completely see why it's the Oscar triple threat that it is. Um, uh, for maybe people here who are watching uh, who haven't seen the film, could could you both maybe give us a brief description as to what it's about? I've never been asked to do that before on a QA. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm afraid of messing up. <laughs> um, I feel like there's like a pre written synopsis, right, Kenneth, that we're supposed to like. Yeah, I feel like, like we, we should have prepared this or practiced this. <laughs> 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 but do you want to give it a go, Jess? Well, I like, cue you guys in, you can take a sentence at a time, you know. You can this. <laughs> no, it's so bad. Whenever you say full stop, I can say go. Oh. I feel like every Q&A we do, Ken and I just have this dance of like, do you want to, do you want to answer this question? <laughs> but, uh, but no, I mean, like I can, I, can t I can take a shot at it. I mean, the film's about uh, Amin, who is an Afghan uh, refugee. Uh, I think when we when we started the film, it was very like important to Jonas, who's the director, that it's not like a refugee film. Um, so the the real crux of the story is that it's it's a relationship film between uh, um, like Jonas, the director, and his one of his best friends uh, from growing up. They met when they were in high school, and um, after Amin came to Denmark uh, from Afghanistan, and. I mean, grew up in Denmark with without really telling anyone his his backstory, and then uh, as an adult, Jonas managed to uh, to get him to to sit down and kind of tell it all to him for the first time, but also on on camera. And it's like a recorded interview, and the film is is a, a kind of reenactment slash yeah uh, adaptation of the, those interviews. It's it's a it's extremely hard hitting film to hearing him remember um, the the past as he's going through it for Jonas and the recordings, um, and it's 
it's extremely validating to see this kind of film in the animation category, you know, like uh, for me as an animation artist to see animation chosen as the medium to, to produce flea. It's, it's great to see that it's been looked at as the medium and not as a genre. And uh, I think flea is a great example of this, you know, it's, it, it's a documentary. It's not just a family film. Um, there's, there's more to animation than being maybe just positioned off to one demographic. You know, it can be horror, it can be a Western. Um, and this is an incredible documentary. Of, uh, yeah, you, absolutely something more than a refugee story. A friendship. There's um, a, a layer, a whole load of, of, uh, of, of elements to this that we'll go into later on. But for this particular one, I'm very very excited to see that it's been looked at as 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 a different kind of subject in the animation category um and i have to ask like does it feel that way to you guys does it feel like some kind of validation that animation has kind of been risen up uh, from just one genre and did you find any advantages in using animation to tell a main story you can go for that one <laughs> Thank you, Jess. Um, I think, I mean, Jess and I both talk about the fact that that you often get asked, like, why is it animation? And you sort of have to um, sort of justify why you tell the story with the animation media. And we're both a little bit frustrated and sort of annoyed by that question because the medium by itself gives it a, a, like its own flavor. And, and there are so many ways to to use animation to tell stories. So having having this being recognized with Flea is, is at least for me, it's like, it, it, it's it's so nice. And it, I really hope it, it paves the way for more films like this to be made with animation. Um, I think it adds an extra layer of, uh, of empathy, actually, because you, you are not just shown a human face where you can see every single emotion and everything like readable on the face you have to try and interpret or sort of read from the character from the drawing and from our interpretation of of the story um and i think that adds an extra layer of like mysticism or in interpretation and stuff to it that that like live footage wouldn't have uh, you can always if and i know you honestly joked about that he doesn't know he doesn't know how we would have made it in live action unless we had a huge budget because we don't have that place in Denmark where we could go and film it, but it could be, you know, Afghanistan in the eighties, like reliably. Um, so that would just be something that you could sort of nitpick uh, and find like, oh, that, that was like a cheap green screen used there, where animation is just more like holistic, like a um, technique we could use. Plus when you then drift in and out of these different styles, which shows for when it gets very emotional, when it becomes these more charcoal like styles or, uh, when we jump back and forth in time and stuff, you can do these things more elegantly because it, 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 there's not this sort of abrupt change of style uh, because everything is stays within the animation media. And like, there's a couple of things that I, I, I hear you exactly what you mean by kind of getting annoyed by asked, oh, why animation? You know, that was actually something that I remember being asked a lot in college when you'd pitch something to a teacher and they go, ah, this could be done in live action. Why are you using animation? But there's so many advantages in this particular instance, like trying to keep a men's identity um, secret, you know, it's, just, it's, it's, it's so perfect for that purpose. Um, and then doing things, as you mentioned there with the, the charcoal line, like there is these amazing scenes where you guys render uh, something like, you know, like, like it gets hard to breathe at times for the characters and you manage to render this thing figuratively on screen it's not something that lends itself well to a live action you, you can't really do that there and um, could you talk a little bit more about how you how you came across these two styles there's there there's the charcoal line style you talked about there's also kind of a more of a traditional a character 2d style um and funnily enough usually when people do a uh, a kind of a you know a, a, a cross dissolve into a backstory then they favor animation but you guys kind of cross dissolve into archive footage of you know when these events are actually happening in the real world maybe you could talk a little bit about how you use all this mixed media yeah it was a bit of a, a juggle um 
I think the the like partially a lot of it is for like budget considerations, which I mean we all know that that's going to come into it, and it always feels like a weird part to mention because you want to you know say that it was for an artistic reason, and a lot of it was, but especially the archive stuff, for instance, was was um, both a way to kind of ground the film in reality and like remind people that it was it's really happening, and for people to also kind of see. Like we've definitely had people come up and say like, oh, you know, I remember that news reporter from when I was growing up and that sort of thing. So you could picture yourself and what you were doing at the time um, that the moments in the film are happening. Um, so that was kind of both to cut down the amount of animation we had to do, but also to ground the film. Um, so that was kind of always planned in from the beginning from the producer's end. Um, and I think we ended up just kind of using a bit more than we, than we thought we would because it's such a good establishing like moment to cut to that and then to cut to like the animation's interpretation of the place. Um, but for the other kind of two, three styles, there's, there's like two kind of visual styles, but like three cinematic styles, I guess, which sounds very fancy if I to say it that way. But uh, I think we had the kind of realistic style, more realistic style at least, uh, which is split up into like the, kind of past tense where we're going back in time to I means like recounting of what happened when he when he fled the country but then we also have this documentary more like present time of the scenes where he's interacting with his his boyfriend and uh kind of living his life in the present and the interview scenes as well um which were stylistically graphically the same but was shot differently one was shot more like a narrative fiction and then the other one was shot more like a documentary with like jump cuts and things to try and emphasize those two things but in terms of the actual style I think that's partially that was Jonas coming from like a more live action background this is this was his first animation uh, actually like he did some testing with Sun Creature and the company before launching into the the main film project but for him it, as a director he's only really worked with live action but his actual original background is in radio and um, which is why the audio I think is so strong for the, for the film um, but we did a, a test quite early on because the film's taken like seven years it was like five years of fund uh, to make so during that funding process there was some different tests done and there was one that was much more uh, there was a trailer done that was much more kind of not necessarily toony but more stylized uh, characters so it was still kind of realistic shapes but with exaggerated proportions and that sort of thing um, and he felt that that was went too toony and he just kept pulling it more and more realistic uh, so I think coming from that like real live action documentary background kind of pulled the style automatically into that space um, but then the graphical like memory we call it the graphical sequences it's a weird term because it is all inherently graphical but uh, the the charcoal like animation was kind of always intended to be uh, moments when Amin is either was not present for the thing that he's talking about or it was a very, very traumatic experience in his life. So he either can't remember very well or he's trying to picture what might have happened based off someone telling him what happened uh, at some point. Uh, so like, for instance, when the sisters flee uh, Russia, then it's all kind of based on their telling of what happened afterwards. Um, and those were supposed to be very like stream of consciousness because of because of that uh, that it wasn't like a concrete memory. Um, but originally the animation was supposed to be kind of much more loose uh, back when he really first pitched the idea, and I think it was almost more supposed to be more like that style. And then it became the rest of it became more concrete. So he always had a very good idea of what that should look like. Um, and then we had Simon Roby and uh, some concept artists come by to do the look development for those sections. And then that was all animated by uh, Studio Tantin and Gilles Cuvelier in France, who kind of took that whole section. We wanted it to feel kind of like an art piece within the film. So they just blitzed through like two, two animators and did. That's, that's really interesting. It, it actually has started off with a kind of, um, well, seven years ago. To go back to that first, I took a few notes there. Like that is a long time. That is, that's, that's tough. That's hard work. Um, but you seem to start off with a really kind of cartoony style first. You, you mentioned the, something more stylized. Yeah, it was. It was. It wasn't necessarily like super 
cartoony it was more like um it was still kind of gritty like the backgrounds had that kind of like more detailed gritty realism to them but the the actual characters like they had bigger eyes and just bigger proportions of like head based on other like versus other anatomy and that sort of thing so it wasn't like classically toony but it was more toony than the the final version definitely yeah it's very interesting that's not a route i thought um was even explored because i got this feeling from watching the film that there's such a an emphasis on, on on subtlety throughout. I mean, even the story and the designs. I mean, there, there's barely a mark or, or a, anything on anyone's face or design or even the backgrounds more than there needs to be on screen to convey any kind of emotion expression. And despite that kind of minimalism, everything is so very expressive. And um, there are these amazing gestures and expressions like. Uh, one particular scene when I was watching it blew me away was uh, when Amin was going through boxes of photographs in his attic and he comes across graduation photos of himself and Jonas, I think, and, and someone else in one of their dates, I think. And it's just uh, whatever pose and pushing, pouting this lip. It's just, it wasn't something I thought this kind of subtle style could actually manage to do. Um, but you, you do so and with aplomb, it, it's, it's, it's done so well. And that, that happens throughout. There's another moment where there's just a pan across the table when the sisters are after hearing something particularly big in the story. I don't want to spoil it for anybody. And there's this amazing expression. Um, and sometimes it's just by pushing him out a little too far this way or that way. And, and just by doing that, you've got exactly a feeling as opposed to maybe trying to do too much with loads of lines on a face. And, um, but I'm amazed to hear there was even an exploration into something other than this kind of subtle um, kind of quiet authenticness about everyone's deliberate movements, you know? Um, I mean, that's really, that. that's all down to Kenneth. Ken, that's the subtle, the subtleness is, is yeah, his, definitely his voice. Like, Oh yeah, that was that was a goal throughout the production. <laughs> yes, I, I, I mean we had to, in the animation bible we had like three sort of keywords that we that we went for, which were like authentic, um, organic, and then subtle as well. Um, authentic was like a main word because we we wanted to make sure that, that the movie felt authentic, that that you felt like it was a real story, and, and that we treated his story right, so that we would never like venture into a caricature or, or being too extreme with how characters act or express. Um, often in animation, when you, if you want to draw someone sad, then they often look like really sad, uh, where like less is, is like normally more in, especially for this film. Um, and when you have Amin's voice on top of it, being so expressive and so emotional, you, you can really just lean on that and let that tell the story. Um, but then again, like the organic feel, I think for me, it comes down to humor as well, actually, because um, the character designer, Mikkel Sommer, his, his character designs, they have so much character in them. Um, so even though the style is super subtle, the, the choices he has made for like what kind of hairs you would have in, in the 80s and uh, what kind of outfits you would be in, it has a lot of humor in it in a way that, that again, makes it feel super human. Um, in the way that when you think back then, like, oh, hey, we, we looked so silly back then, or, and, and that just like giving that sort of like frailty to a human because they were looking silly or because they, you know, you act a certain way or in your graduation photo, even though you're in, you're, you're in this, like you're this teenager in the too big of a suit and you're trying to look cool. So you're doing this weird power that just, it makes you so relatable, I think, um, which again, just invites for empathy and, and to like lean into the characters and, and for them to be likable. Um, so it was this constant dance of like, when can we have a little bit of this humor in there and a little bit of this, um, like glint in the eye, you could say, but in a, in a tasteful way where it, it sort of felt very authentic again, but then again, staying subtle, uh, and, and, um, uh, what do you call it, respectable when it comes down to the real emotions and trauma and these things, and then being like really um subtle because the story like more or less tells itself you know that that if you flee from your country it must be really you know gut-wrenching and, and and what what must go on in their minds and stuff so you don't have to draw a person looking like really like big eyes and like eyebrows all up into the 
the top of the head and like mouth all goes down because you already know like oh I, I wonder what's going on in their head so you actually a blank face makes you study them much more and try to figure out like I wonder what they feel you want to empathize you want to like look into past their their mask you could say um, and I think that's what the the subtleness of it like really really brings to it. It, it really does. You, you said less is more there. And I, I really got that feeling throughout the whole thing as well, all the way from the story to designs, all the way through. And there was this um this this particular moment where where less is more that I mean, I must have watched this scene 10 times at the stage. I think it's it's phenomenal. And it's it's um I'll just skip ahead a bit of anything, but since we're kind of at this point, I'd like to talk about it now. That there, there's an amazing scene where Amin has just come back from work. Um, he's been away. He's at the airport, and and Casper, his his partner, is there waiting for him. And when we arrive, uh, initially, our, our establishing at the scene is is all these people embracing at the airport, happy to see one another. Um, the sounds we hear are people embracing and happy to hear one another and feet moving, all this kind of stuff. But Amin is just standing there staring at Casper and he's not, he's not moving. Um, like Casper's not moving back. There's a little bit of where he stands up. Uh, like I'd love if you could talk about this kind of silent negotiation. What was going through your head? Because it says so much and you do absolutely nothing. And they just stand there. If you could please break down your process. I know you were you were a board artist on this. If you maybe talk about that a bit, that'd be I'd really appreciate it being a board artist myself. Sure. I think I think again it, it comes down to you have the whole film leading up to this moment of all the things that Amin has to lose, all the things he is struggling with internally. The scene just before this, Jonas is interviewing him and then ends on the question like, but you still have some things to to organize. You still have some some things you need to figure out, right? And Amin doesn't answer, he just looks down in thought. And then you cut to him coming back to, uh, to Copenhagen and, and Avio talks about um, what, it, what home means and, and, and like you grow up too fast, I remember him saying. And then as you say, you have all these, you have these like images of him like traveling in, in transit. And then you cut to these images of people embracing and being happy to see each other while he talks about home. Um, so, Again, like less is more. Like you would be tempted as an animator to 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 have all these like, oh, what is this uh, internal uh, story going on right now? I wonder if you would like, or oh, maybe if I raise that eyebrow just slightly because it sort of hints it leans towards Casper. So if I lean the face, down. but again, like you would like you don't need to because you you have that whole the whole film tells the story, and and right there you just need to leave space for that tension. So doing doing anything at that moment would actually ruin that tension and bring the focus away from that scene and from that story that is being told. Um, and that is something that, I mean, we often have to tell the animators, like pull back because you are taught as an animator um, to be expressive and to 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 like really study like the lines and think like, okay, this is the line, but what is he actually saying is this. So that means on that that word, I have to make a sad face instead of him, all those things. Um, but looking at, at humans and working with a, a director coming from live action and documentary, um, he often like said, no, 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 like take away all that stuff. Cause normally you, you would have like your emotions would happen internally and, and, and it would, it, it would very, very rarely be expressed that, that, um, excessively, if that makes sense. I'm just going to click, um, on an image here, like a show of some of the designs. Um, it's one of the posters and, um, it, uh, just to illustrate what I mean when I'm talking about how how, how, how how kind of deceptively simple the designs are, um, they're really brought back to just what's needed to convey who's who. There's there's a certain silhouette that's establishing by everyone. You, you kind of know each individual just by looking at them. Like everyone's sense of style. You can see what you're talking about, what, what they'd wear and what decade. Um, it's oh, who did you say the character designer was? You mentioned the French person, I believe. Uh, no, this one was a, a Danish um, uh, a cartoonist actually called uh, Mikkel Sommer. It's 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 fantastic work. Um, it's just it's so unique to 
this film as well. It's not a style that I've seen come out of, um, of, of some creative before either, um, which I'd like to talk about as well, because it seems like you've really got a whole sense of, of, of a new team, a production completely tailored for this film. Um, could you talk about maybe like how you found the, the, the talent and maybe how you kind of found the inspiration to come with these designs? When, when I was looking at them initially, it kind of reminded me of, of, of Daniel Klaus and Ando Musashi, you know, this kind of weird um, mix between the two. But um, if you could talk about maybe the inspirations, how, how you sourced, um, uh, maybe how you moved away from your 2 designs to how you kind of came back to this very subtle, uh, uh, bare minimum, only what's needed design process. That'd be great. Do you want to, I, I, I'm, I'm not actually sure how Mikkel got involved. Can it, can you, do you remember exactly how it happened? I think we were, we were looking into like, uh, graphic novel, uh, references, uh, because they often have, have that more, like it's still an expressive style, but it just feels more mature. Uh, and when, when we did that first trailer with the, the, the style that just talked about, um, both Monica, the, the producer on Final Cut side, and, and Jonas said that they, they needed a style that if you just flick through the channel and you edit on Flea, it would feel like a movie for grown-ups, that they would have a maturity to it. Um, so we were looking through some like, graphic novel um, references, and I think that's where we came across Mikkel. Uh, we've worked with him before as well on, on some other things as Sun Creature um, for Ivando, for example. Um, so, so I don't remember like specifically how it came up, but we probably some of, one of us probably suggested him because he is an amazing designer and he has this sort of slightly quirky approach. So it just feels like that nails the the the, the character uh, like really quickly. Um, but definitely that sort of like graphic novel feel was something we were aiming for. Uh, um, which is also why we kept a lot of those like squiggly lines and the sketchiness of the characters uh, and of the, the early concepts that he did. Uh, we really liked that sort of sketch to it because that had that organic, like really lively feel. Uh, so it wouldn't become too, uh, it should, it's like making a really mature style. You can often fall into the trap of making a, a boring style as well. Something that might not be as appealing to look at. Um, and again, this movie needed to like really be about the human uh, behind uh, the story and not, not just a story about a refugee, but a story about I mean, a human uh, being. Um, I think Jonas often says that, that refugees are often, uh, often the, what is it, they're characterized by what they need because they need a home and they're not as often sort of seen as like who they actually are. Uh, so again, having a style that, that felt very you know, that, that, draw, that drew you in was really important. Uh, and having that warmth in the, in, in the style was really important. I, I have to say, I really did think it was a, a comic book or a graphic novel when I first saw the image, because um, I, I, like, I, I, I love comic books. And I was like, how is this a comic book? And I haven't heard about it. I, I think I Googled it straight away when I, when I was watching it, because you do have those kind of um, shadowed under the chin brush marks almost, like it was inked. Um, it's it's beautiful. It's 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 absolutely um, it's a stunning design. And even though it's quite uh, like minimal, it, there's, it kind of brings this um, big impact when there's scenes like this at the very start, and we can see Amin dancing through the street, and because he's moving so much, when there's not so much movement around at all, it really it's so appealing and it's so exciting and you would have thought at this point very early on in the film i would have realized that this wasn't rotoscoped and um, but it was only at a point where during the kitchen when i realized oh way over the way he's moving a plate this thing is is animated um have you guys gotten a lot of that do, does do a lot of people think that this is this is a rotoscoped film yes <laughs> No, I mean, like we laugh because I think we um, we get like we get it in varying amounts. I think like some, especially people who aren't involved with animation themselves. I think because of the because the movements are that more subtle and more realistic, and people are used to seeing like over exaggeration and squash and stretch and things. And I think people who haven't worked in animation tend to assume that it's rotoscoped. But I think a lot of animators can can kind of see that it that it isn't. Um, but we always get kind of told to push that it's not. 
but it's not rotoscope. So I think from a like P from a PR side, there must be like more people assuming it that at least have personally told us about it. So, um, yeah, I think, I think for us, it was important to not, not rotoscope it. Um, because it should still feel like an interpretation of, of what we've seen from like an Amin's character and, uh, and, and, and person, I guess, uh, it shouldn't feel like kind of a, I don't know, there's something, there's something about rotoscoping that almost feels inauthentic in a way, for some reason, because you're kind of copying a movement, you don't, you're not really understanding where the movement is coming from, uh, you're just tracing it, so it, ha it doesn't have the, the same motivations behind it, um, at least that's from my point of view, I don't, like, I've never, not heard you talk about it either, can it, but, but uh, yeah, that, that, like, for me, that it was always really important that it wasn't rotoscope. Yes, totally, and I think I think you're, you're like uh, nailing it on the head that yes, with the the fact that rotoscoping actually makes it feel less authentic, even though you are copying the exact movement or something, you don't go in and you don't copy the intention of the movement, if that makes sense, uh, and that's why you don't again you don't you don't capture the the spirit of 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 that person and what they were doing. You just you just copy just like a filter put on top, uh, which again obscures rather than 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 feels authentic. Yeah, I, I, it's. I mean, you've, you're so right there. It, it's an interpretation of a story, and to rotoscope will be doing it a disservice. I think, um, considering you've gone so far in exploring the style, um, the backgrounds, the animation, the, the the design itself, to then not have a minimalistic, uh, purposeful animation would 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 uh, just kind of undo some of the good you have done. Um, can we talk a little bit about the animation as well? Like, uh, it is a master class in, in, in just kind of conveying a, a really purposeful mood, um, uh, uh, really making the audience relate immediately with the characters as opposed to being told how to feel because the characters are going through something. Like I, I kind of felt that this this could easily have turned into a story about a victim, um, but it, it doesn't at any point. There, there's these all these other stories going on, and uh, in no way do I feel like I should feel sorry for him. I actually feel sorry for him, and I believe it's a lot of that is what you're talking about with trying to convey an emotion as opposed to copy. Could you talk about the process maybe and how you guys did that? How how far was the animation pushed before you decided to bring it back to what you have? And you're, you're talking specifically about like the movement of the characters, like how they act and stuff. Okay. Um, I mean, again, I think so much of it comes down to, again, like the, the script and the story itself of how it's being told, um, how the, like how the, the, the scenes are set up as well in terms of, of how it's like the, all the setup is, is, is really well done as well, which, which makes the, the work for the animators easier, I think, because they don't have to, to carry a certain story or a certain acting moment. Um, if that if that makes sense. Um, so I think we like the process of animation was that because Jonas wasn't he hasn't done animation before, as just said, then then we we did a rough pass of through a few scenes. So the, the, every animator would get like a chunk of scenes. So they would have like rhythm and flow through a sequence to work with. They would rough that out really, like very roughly, and then we would show that to Jonas so you could see the intention of it. And that's where you could sort of pull back on certain expressions, something like that. Um, and then we would add keys to that to sort of make the characters be on model and make sure that, that their expressions weren't, like, weren't too much. Um, I, I remember the, he kept telling us to close the mouths of, of the characters because whenever they saw something, they would be like, like, like that and, and he says like no one would ever be like that like you would like you would mostly have your mouth closed instead um so he would he would be over that to sort of with his eye and him coming from another medium uh, being able to to make sure that it stayed authentic um whereas i think we as, as coming from animation we have our tendencies as well to work with um and our sort of what we are brought up uh, through our animation uh, education that that you know Oh, when a character is thoughtful, they have their mouth open for some reason. It's something I've learned <laughs> through school that I now need to unlearn. Um, but it, it was a process for for 
yeah, for going with Jonas, but then I, I have to give a lot of credit as well to just the script and the editor and also just to sort of like set dress everything and making sure that the, the locations felt super authentic and the, the uh, what do you call it, that the, like researching the time periods and the locations and making sure that it just, it feels like the right place. So that just adds to the sense of them being real people, depending on what they have in the rooms and stuff. So, so that is also like a credit to Jess for, for set dressing everything that well. Thank you. <laughs> no, I think, I think Kenneth's Ken really Ken right in that like a lot of them, we, we had the sound so early as well. Like we had all the recordings and, and that was all kind of edited into like a script form of, of the sound um, that the animators then had to work from. So I think, I think you also kind of got to know Amin and kind of, there's a little bit, you know, when you listen to like your favorite podcast and you're like, oh, I've kind of become friends with these people, even though I've never met them. Like, I think, I think you, 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 uh, of course, it's always different to hear when you hear a story about someone you don't know getting a divorce or something very sad where you feel like, oh, like you said, you feel like you should feel sorry for them and it's sad news, but it's different when you, someone you know has that happen to them. And I think because we listen to so much of, I means like uh, retelling and 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 saw footage of him and stuff of it, you know as a, as the team we were, had access to more of what is shown in the final film. So so at some point you also kind of feel like you just have to do your friend justice in a weird way, even though like I've I've personally never met him. So it's a it's a strange like way to exist. I think as a, in in the filmmaking, it's it's I've not really encountered a project that's similar or. Yeah, in, in, in that way, I guess. That's interesting. So you got like emotionally invested with this guy you haven't met. I would have thought by now you guys would have met this guy. And, you know, uh, that's, that's very interesting. It was, it was very purposeful that, that we didn't because I, I think, uh, I mean, and you almost had talked a lot about how much uh, he would be involved in the film and, and, uh, and he was very happy for you to kind of, he was like, you know, like I, I've told you my story and with knowing what you were like, I told you it knowing where, what was intended like for that it would become a film kind of thing. Um, so he was like, I'm happy for you to, as my friend who I trusted with this, to go and take it and do your version of, of what I have said. And I think he, he didn't really, because obviously it's, it's painful for him to relive a lot of these things as well. So he didn't want to see that much all the time. Um, so there was definitely like back and forth with Jonas, but but I mean, it was kept very separate from like the whole crew. I mean, it's also kind of weird when you have a load of people that are like, we know everything about you, but like you never talked to us, like, you know, nothing about us. It's like, it's an inherently one-sided relationship. So I think that they were quite like protective of each other in that way as like good friends are, I guess. Yeah. That's, that's really impressive. So I, I would have thought you guys would have met up and kind of, but I, I can see why not having met him uh, it makes it a little easier to keep his identity secret and it, it makes like the, one of the questions I wanted to ask was with regards to trying to come up with the environments and locations like are you working from photos that he's given you or something or are you just listening to the audio and going through Google and coming up with some kind of well, what existed at that time um because uh, are you just solely using his audio as your source of reference uh, we had we had a bit more because especially the like present day documentary stuff we had a lot of actual handheld footage from like we didn't recreate that when we did the like some of it is kind of based off footage but but it, like the animation it's not copies of of footage and um, so we had a little bit more to go on than um, than just the audio for the like present day sequences but of course those are also kind of the easiest ones to research because it's the current place like a lot of it's all filmed. Well, shot in Denmark, so it's also where we live. Um, but in terms of like the, the the sequences that were set into the past, then yeah, you're you're pretty spot on with like we just did a lot of research about what was like a classic um, Moscow apartment and what what did Kabul look like. And I think that like Kabul was really hard because there's just not a lot out there. Like it, it's pre-internet. It's like pre. Taliban really even so it's there's just not very much at all like it's been a war zone for so long that so much of that was has either been like 
never digitized or was lost or all sorts of things. So we had some people who, whose responsibility it was to like source the archive footage that's in the film. And, and along with that came some um, visions of Kabul. Like you see it in the beginning of the film. So sorry, you might hear like my son's crying in the background. <laughs> it's okay. My husband's got it. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, there, there was, you see it in the beginning with, showing Kabul at that time period and things like there was stuff we had to go on but it was it was pretty minimal um so I remember going to like the library and reading like Russian accounts of Kabul during the Russian investigation and there was like maybe someone described a street at some point and like what they were selling on the street it was just like yes uh because it was so hard to find information whereas like Russia was a lot more easy because it was uh you know there's like apartments in Poland that have been built to resemble what it would look like in the communist era and that sort of thing. Like there's a lot more documentation around it, I guess. Um, so, so there was like varying degrees of difficulty of research, but for us it was always just really important that we were portraying that as like accurately as, as we could, that if they picked up a phone that it would be like, this was the phone you could buy, not necessarily at that exact point in time in Russia, but like what you could have bought 20 years earlier because the apartment they were in is so like badly furnished or hasn't been renovated in a long time. And all these kind of questions that you would ask yourself in if you were set dressing it in live action, trying to apply the same thought process to animation. That's, that's really interesting because you do an amazing thing with, with all the locations where like when, when they're in, when they're in Kabul, when he's at home, there's, these lovely blue skies that are flying kites off rooftops and everything's really happy and warm and comforting. And then they get to Moscow and it just feels joyless and there's everything feels washed out and you do feel like you're in danger almost, you know, that the slightest thing out of the norm means they're, they're in trouble. And there's so many moments like where like they are in so much trouble and it is so difficult to watch what's happening. And then you cut to, you know, another point in time in his life and we're back to lush greens and happy blue skies again. And you're, you're how, how you convey a message just by the color involved in the background is, is, is really, really interesting. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, I think we talked a lot about lighting. Um, and I think one, one thing that was really important for us that Jonas and I discussed quite early on is that like, I think quite often in, in animation, we, we like over production design stuff, right? Like you, you could, like Kenneth said, like you could do so much to like, let's lean the face in towards this character and then everything in the image will point at the focal point of the image and contrast and that and that. And, and I mean, that, that stuff is all like really, useful to, to the trade but I think it, you can apply it in different ways and and I think for us it was like for instance with the weather like the weather should never the, we, we can kind of have the idea that it should never reflect like an idealized version of the situation like just because he's happy doesn't mean that it should be blue skies kind of thing it should be you know even even in um, narrative live action films they, they they kind of do that to a certain extent like you can choose when to shoot your your scenes but but because we wanted it to be more documentary-esque, then it was like, well, if it's rainy the day that they go and do this one happy thing, then like, oh no, it's a shame, but like you can be happy in the rain as well. Um, so I think there was there was a lot of discussion around that in the beginning. Um, and that kind of also led into, of course, the discussions around color script and what the lighting should do. Um, and we looked a lot at, I'm not really sure why we did it. I think we had it on like references board for cinematography, but we ended up looking a lot at like Korean films of recent years because they have this very like high contrast lighting where um, like with like burning, for instance, that came out a few years ago. We looked at that film quite a lot because there's so many scenes where you see something very simple happening. And then the rest of the shot is just completely black because the contrast is so high on the exposure and, and that sort of thing. Um, and we, we wanted to try and hide as much as we could in, in darkness, uh, partially for budget constraints, but also because it, it, it made it hard for Amin to hide. I think that like, if he had to kind of tell his story, then he would be in like harsh light. Uh, whereas if he was able to kind of hide away behind, uh, his own keeping distance from other people and things, then, then it was more then he could be more in darkness or it'd be more subtle lighting or that sort of thing. Um, we looked a lot at, Edward Hopper paintings because I think those have this very like high contrast, um, a lot of pastoral scenes and like everyday scenes, but this high contrastness that feels very alienating and, and 
uh, yeah, kind of hard to escape from, I guess. Um, so I think it, it all kind of led into this this aesthetic of that, like, no matter how much you flee your situation, you kind of always take it with you. Um, and that that was a big part of the consistency and the color across all the sequences. I, I noticed a lovely thing when you mentioned lighting there, like, and, and kind of throughout the film, there's always like that on set almost somewhere, whether it's the little chain that he gets, that he, that he holds on for the rest of his time, or, or if there's a possibility of a something over there, or it, there's always a little glimpse of light somewhere. I always kind of felt that someone was thinking like, there's a little bit of hope somewhere in that every time there was a little bit of light on screen, I just thought that was just, just such a lovely of the elements to always have and i noticed that um i'm just going to share another image here um this was when it clicked at me that you guys are doing that uh, can you see the image excellent and um, just here every time he was talking to Jonas in the film there was a light or something in and around the area and it was particularly big um in comparison maybe to some of the other elements of the script and i was wondering if this was like a purposeful movement to make sure that there was some kind of i don't know yellow or some kind of just light in general to make sure that there was a, a feeling of this is where i mean is comfortable at this point of time this is where he's comfortable here uh i, I don't want to blow the ending so i don't want to talk about like um the light news near the end but like the whole way through i thought that this was just a really clever device and uh it, it, was this a purposeful thing or is this just in my head because I've been watching this for, for, for so long now or the past week? I know, I know. I mean, it was, it was the lighting placement was very purposeful. Like for instance, this scene that you're talking about, it's, I think it's a good example because uh, like, I think Denmark as a country has very specific lighting. Like there's a real big history of like lighting design here uh, and like warmth of lighting. And that's what like, people are very, uh, very into it in Denmark. Um, but like my local metro station is named after like a guy that did light design. Yeah, there's uh, strange things. But but for instance, that picture also has you know like a neon red light outside as well. And that was that like sometimes that would come back as like a threatening thing. Like there's scene there's a scene where like a kid has light up shoes, for instance. So we would have like some flashing red lights scattered throughout that scene to try and make that feel threatening. But then it also represents like the neon lights of coming to like a capitalist society after being part of like communist uh, Moscow for so long, um, like post-communist Moscow, I guess. Um, and, and yeah, I think, I think this, the scenes, especially where, where I mean, feels more comfortable than the lighting is definitely less harsh as, as a purposeful attempt to show that like, okay, I, th I think because so much of what we saw was based off these interview footage, which was very nicely lit and felt very comfortable that it was this thing of like, Jonas has always done a really good job of making it mean feel comfortable with what's going on with the film and what's going on in, in production and story. And also what happened after the film was finished. So, so I guess that was also part of it is like giving the film the grace to say like, it's okay to tell this story now um, and to try and mimic that kind of interview setting no matter where he was, uh, I, I guess, uh, when he's, especially when he's talking to you, honestly. That's, that's really interesting. I mean, this, the story that he gets from Amin throughout that interview process, I'm just going to share another picture there, because um, the, the process was to set him down, lying down, and he would um, just kind of recall um, as much as he could do from memory, he would get uh, and then to describe areas, sounds, that kind of stuff. So he, he would kind of feel that he was he was back living it again. And I was like, I mean, that had to be an amazing source of, of material for you guys to try and draw from as well. If if finding places like Kabul was so hard, maybe did you draw from these more than, than you thought you would do? And did you get more from an audio recording than you thought was possible? I think so also unconsciously you know like you soak so much of it up just from because of course you can't help but like he's really like i think at the end of the film i think i remember like talking to you and being like thank like thank god he's a, like a great storyteller uh, at the end of the day um because he he does a really good job of even though he's not consciously doing it i think he, he's like got a really good pace and tone and, and the way his flow is in storytelling is really good so i think you can't help but listen to it and picture what he's talking about um, and you know, Jonas always mentions that 
because his background is in radio documentary, then he would use this particular tactic of interviewing where it was like, okay, try and picture where you were when this happened, describe the situation to me to try and get people to, to go back to that place um, because it tends to make for much more visceral retellings. Um, so that, that definitely comes from his kind of radio background as well, um, which was a massive bonus. Because yeah. it's quite a story to, to unfold and juggle. I mean, he gets a lot out of him using this process. And the, I mentioned the layers of an onion when we, when we began. But like, there's, there is a refugee story. I know he, this is a story about his friend and it is a friendship story. Um, but there is a refugee story and there's also a coming out story and there's a love story. There's a family story. There's, there, there's so much to unfold from this. Yeah, you guys managed to juggle quite a lot. I mean, even the timeline jumping, I mean, that's usually difficult enough as it is, you know? Um, but you guys managed to do all this, uh, in no way make it feel rushed or, or pushed in or, in, in no way made it feel forced. Everything, as you know, the word authentic again, I was going to use it. Um, it just feels very real, very genuine. Um, I mean, it does feel like a friend that I know now. And there was that moment in the airport where, you know, having gone past the Mujahideen, the corrupt police in Moscow, and uh, like having such a horrible time with, with uh, traffickers, like to then see him almost make the choice of, of not spending the rest of his life with this guy. Uh, even when he started walking, when you had him walk towards him, I was almost certain uh, kind of that he was going to walk past him and it was going to be a horrible ending to this. I, I couldn't, I couldn't have it. Um, I, I got so involved in this character. Um, uh, a credit to both of you. It, it, it's a stunning production. Um, amazing work. I, I feel like we're going to be talking about this for quite some time. Um, it's not a film that comes around that often that I think educates viewers on a number of subjects in, in such a way that you've managed to do here. Um, there's also something I want to talk about in a little bit general. Um, this film came about because of a, a workshop between animators and documentarians. And we're now doing a talk at the Dingle Animation Festival where there's workshops and, and social networking uh, devices. Even, even though this is a, a digital festival this year because of COVID, and there's still events online that people can kind of network in and, and put their best foot forward. Would you guys care to maybe weigh in on this, maybe tell students uh, some kind of method where they can kind of get the most out of their social networking to bridge that gap between student and professional? Ooh, it's, a, it's a tricky question, I think. Um, I think what, what really was uh, a very sort of apparent thing with uh, with the collaboration with Jonas and Monica was that we just had really good chemistry from the beginning. That you could tell that that the vision he had was something that we that we shared. So that when you ping pong, if you can feel that sort of collaborative sort of lightning going uh, across, then that's a really good sign. Of something you should pursue, rather than you know, oh, this would be this would look really good on my CV, or this is a really high profile uh, project. I can definitely see that being successful. If that is your goal of going into it, it, it's it's not it's probably not going to be a good film because you're not invested in the film as a film. You're invested in it as what it can bring you at the end afterwards instead. And I think what what we felt with the collab collaboration on Flea particularly was just that everyone was so invested in it because you could really just you could really feel the film. You could really feel Jonas's motivation to do it because of it. I mean, being his friend. Um, so looking for that sort of creative spark in, in either another creative person who has an idea that you really like and, and you ping pong and you find that collaborative mood about it. I think that is, that is something to, to, to seek out and to, to strive for rather than going for just going for the big names because they, they have a lot of not money and then I'm going to be a rich, famous enemy if I do that. Um, that's probably my, my tip, <laughs> even though it's a little vague probably. Well, I think I was going to say pretty much the same thing. I think, I think like all the best collaborations I've had in my like working career so far, which admittedly is not like super long, but, uh, but I think a lot of it is either people that I've known as, as friends or yeah, have met through networking where as kind of said, like you could feel already that, that you have a good ping pong and, uh, 
yeah, you should, like I, I, I would say the same, like try don't, don't force it, but, but I would put, I think, especially as, as people who work in animation, I think a lot of us come from this background of, of not wanting to go out and do a lot, right? Like at least I, I know for my sake, like I was, I hate networking events. I'd much rather like sit on my couch and, and like, I don't know, watch Scooby-Doo and eat pick and mix. But like, I think, I think you, you can, you, you don't have to go and talk to like everyone in the room, right? You can go and talk to like one other person and, and who knows, you might, you might meet someone who, who creatively is a really good, like benefit, like benefit to, to, to your life for like a long, like I know if, at least for me, the people I met through this film and, and collaborated with have, have become like lifelong friends, I think. So I think it, it's just putting yourself in the way to make those connections, even if they don't seem like connections in the beginning that would, that would be even like a work related thing. I think they can come from the weirdest place, this kind of stuff. Um, like so many people who, who worked on this film were right time, right place people um and as Kenneth said they were all really committed to the film and and like it's documentary animation it's not a lot of money like the budget for Flea I think people keep saying like oh for a documentary it's an obscene amount of money for an animation it's very little money um so so we were lucky that we had all these people who were like really passionate about it and you can only meet those people by interacting with people uh in in like real life or virtual or however, however you do it, you just kind of got to push through the uncomfortable beginning. Like, so this is networking. What should we talk about? And, and yeah, just let it flow. That's great. So kind of look for that synergy with someone as opposed to look for the big names and kind of get in the moment, I guess, as opposed to force uh, some kind of fake camaraderie that hopefully leads to a mutual end for us just enjoying working on a production with someone. Um, I think that's everything, guys. Um, I'd like to thank you both so much for your time. Um, do you guys have Twitter handles or social medias you'd like to promote? I, uh, I don't know. I have, I have Instagram, <laughs> but uh, I feel like an old man saying that these days. Um, but that's it. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't think it needs to be promoted, though. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> I feel a car guy. <laughs> <laughs> Do it, Ken. He's got a really good Instagram. Go follow his Instagram. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll follow your Instagram. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Jess, have you uh, social media you want to acknowledge? Uh, I do. I'm in the same boat as Ken. Like, Ken, it, Ken it updates his Instagram way more than I update his, like, my Instagram. But by all means, like, uh, come, and, come and follow me. And, uh, and I, I may start to post things when I get over being a new parent. And, uh, yeah. But, uh, no, my, my Instagram handle is just my name and then, like, underscore AD, which someone pointed out to me was, like, Jess Nichols sad. So now I feel <laughs> like I have to change it. But that's what it is. If, uh, <laughs> that's amazing. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find Jess Nichols sad on Instagram. Hopefully yes. you're happy. Um, sad, yes. guys, thank you very much. Congratulations again on the Oscar nominations. It thank really you. is um, not surprising when you see the quality of the film that it is up for three uh, categories. Best international film, best feature, animation feature, and best documentary. Um, I wish you every success with it. I hope it wins everything. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we'll be talking about it for quite some time. It, it, it is going to stand the test of time. Um, big thanks to Scott and the man behind the curtain. Uh, big thanks to Jam Media, to the Dingle team for inviting me to come back again. I love it. Hopefully we can do this again next year. Um, about the next thing Sun Creative are maybe making, we can all stand again, maybe in person. Um, I think that's everything. Thank you very much and goodbye. Enjoy the rest of the event and before I forget, please hang around for the big picture. It'll be on shortly. Thanks very much. Goodbye.